my tribe, uh, uh, even even for a short period in remotely like this. Uh, just a one point, one quick background detail. I am a Hampton Roads uh, sailor from way back when, and in fact, you can if, if you go downtown, you can see my old ship, the Wisconsin. I was a gunnery officer there, uh, coming off in uh, 1991. So it's always fun. It's always fun to be back. And if, in fact, the last time I was in Norfolk, it looked like uh, downtown was having a renaissance. So that that was good. To, that was good to see uh, right there in the right there in the Nauticus area. So uh, what I got, what I have for you all tonight. Is basically the back is basically the back half of the of the lecture that I do for our uh, junior course, the intermediate leadership course at the War College, uh, which is pitched at the operational level. The uh, I will send if if you want to follow up more and hear more about this, I will send Jim a uh, I will send him a link to a full to a full on version that will actually that would actually go much more into the where's and the why what, the, basically the the reasoning the the uh, the ideas motivating Chinese sea power, which is what I give to our senior course uh, at the at the end of each year. So uh, you, you'll, you'll get the operational uh, level stuff and you can look into the bigger ideas that go in uh, into it on YouTube if you choose to do so. So uh, what I what I what I've put, put together is if you if you had a chance to look at the proceedings article that he asked for and that he uh, pushed out to you all. I basically modeled it on that. So this is a presentation that I gave to uh, CNO Richardson back in uh, late 2017. And then I wrote it up as an article for proceedings and tried to, uh, to get as much attention as I could for it, just as we always do when we try to publish something. So why don't I dive right on in? Oh, if my computer will let me dive in, I will dive in. Okay, what are we doing here? Ah, here we go. Okay, so let me launch right into it. As I said, the, I, I will basically look at China's maritime strategy as a two-part thing. One of the, the, the first and the foremost parts, certainly up to date, being based in East Asia, whereby China tries to manage its own surroundings. Second part would be uh, China's, what we're starting to see with China operating more out of area, trying to manage events in the Indian Ocean and places like that. And then I'll flip it around and consider what we should do about it. Because we, as you well know, certainly the Pentagon under uh, under General Mattis and, and, and on on forward has told us that we are in an era of great power strategic competition. Something we haven't seen since uh, since the end of the Cold War, and there, there, we, there's a whole lot of ferment going on as we try to figure out how to manage things in East Asia. So let, let me turn obviously to the, the the first part I will look at. I will call part one active defense in the Western Pacific. This is a Chinese term for how China, how China tries to manage its surroundings vis-a-vis -vis the United States and our allies in the region. Of course, we have, of course, Japan and so forth. We do not have a strategic position in the Western Pacific without these allies. So the more, the more we think of ourselves as an in integral part of an alliance or uh, of several alliances, the better off we all are. Trying to loosen that up and trying to deter us from coming into the theater or perhaps slow us down or even defeat us if we get in a scrap with China would, would, be, would be what active defense is all about. I would, uh, let me let me show you this. This is basically the, uh, I guess this is the thesis for this lecture. It's a, this, this image right here. This is an, the image out of the article from proceedings. And what it's, what it's trying to show is, we, I call it the crumple zone, China's crumple zone. It is trying to push its defenses far offshore so that, this, so that it slows down uh, reinforcements coming from places like Hawaii, San Diego, uh, Washington State, wherever the case may be, to unify with our Seventh Fleet and our allies in times of times of crisis. China needs time if it wants to attack Taiwan, if it wants to seize the Senkaku Islands, do what it thinks it need, might need to do in the South China Sea. So putting putting out a family of systems, shore-based systems and sea-based systems to try to make that happen is really what active defense is all about. It's a, this is a term that goes back to back to Mao Zedong, the founding chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, all the way back, all the way, 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 way far back during the Civil War days, uh, long before the founding of the PRC. What does Mao say about uh, about active defense? Let me let me show you a few things that uh, that I've derived from his writings and from contemporary statements from China uh, about maritime strategy. This is uh, this, this is actually one of the more contemporary uh, statements about active defense. And it comes out of the 2015, uh, merit or not the maritime, but the military strategy. This is China's military strategy. And they, the, 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 the Chinese communist leadership is really, really emphatic about the fact that this Maoist concept, concept of, of how to wage war remains a, an integral and also the central part of China, China's military strategy. Here's a, let me summon, let me summon at the key passage so you don't have to wade through all that, all that verbiage. Active events is not only relevant in this 21st century, long after the death of Mao, but it is the essence, the essence of Chinese communist military strategic thought. 
that's a pretty that's a pretty strong statement of loyalty to this concept. I think that we can we can have the you're obviously seeing uh, some changes outwardly as China develops families of new weapons and so forth. But this basic idea, reaching all the way back to the days in which uh, in which the, the Red Army battled the Imperial Japan and then battled the Chinese nationalists under, under Chiang Kai-shek, really fascinating to see that not only endure into this modern age, but also be uh, essentially transposed offshore and put to work at the surface of maritime strategy. So you're seeing, you're seeing China update this concept and bring it out to sea, rather than being uh, deep within the continental, continental interior of China, where these earlier wars, these founding wars of communist China were actually waged. This is uh, one, point, uh, one point that uh, will come, and we'll, we will return to this time and again, but the, the leadership, the communist leadership is very clear. This is a mode of strategic defense waged through highly offensive operational and tactical uh, methods. That's how they're basically trying to break up our forces at their networks and pounce on them one by one and thus uh, simplify the task for China to, to, to gain time, uh, slow us down and do, uh, do all those things that it needs to do to blunt our offensive as we, try, as we try to come to the assistance of our allies in the Western Pacific. So how do you do it? It's one thing to it's one thing to oh, it's one thing to state a great idea like Mouse. It's another thing, it's another thing to try to make it happen. This is a, this is my effort to find a metaphor, an everyday metaphor for what active defense is all about. The idea of the crumple zone in your car. Think about what think about what that is. I mean, it's not a it's not a rigid it's not a rigid part of your car at all. It's it's, it's designed to. Uh, basically collapse in a controlled way, absorbing uh, absorbing the, the the shock from an from an accident and keeping that shock from being from actually imperiling and, and actually and actually harming what you care about most, which is the people within the cabin, the driver and uh, your kids and your your wife, your your whoever. If you tell you, if you think about if you think about trying trying to put that sort of sacrificial component offshore to collapse in a controlled way. I think that really gets at what active defense is all about. So, you know, Richardson, as you know, he uh, he banned the term, banned the, banned the Navy from using the term uh, access access and area denial a few years ago. He was worried that he was worried that all the maps with all the with all the range rings around the periphery of China uh, implied to non-specialists that these were these were hard basically these these were hard frontiers and we could not go in at all. Certainly, certainly the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, does not think that. I don't think the communist leadership thinks that, and I don't think that's military reality. It's a, th those are describing an area in which they try to make things tough on us. That's not a, so. I don't think that they have harbor any illusions that they can mount an absolute no-go zone, even though that would be the ideal, the ideal from their standpoint. So think, of, so think about, uh, think about that as I just try, as I try to put some, uh, try, try to put some substance into this idea of a, of an offshore crumple zone. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a misleading mis reality a little bit here because the car, the car, because the car is actually the thing that's moving in this particular picture. I couldn't couldn't find another one in which you have something slamming into it. But the thing that's slamming into it would be our Pacific fleet as it makes its way across the Pacific and, and tries to make itself into the theater or make its way into the theater. Okay, let's go back to Mao and think. And you're gonna, I'm going to throw a lot. If you haven't figured it out yet, I'm going to throw a lot of uh, metaphors at it. One thing about Mao is he, he was actually a successful leader during the revolutionary days because he was able to speak with the Chinese people through metaphors, through, through uh, references to Chinese history, and also just to, uh, through everyday analogies that, try to, that, that explain how things work. And he, he loves sports. Here's a quotation in which he's, descri he's describing uh, active defense in terms of two boxers. Let me, start, let me summon, summon out the key words. If he, he's, he's saying that you should do a strategic retreat if you're the inferior power, which China was during the, during the days of the of the Civil War and the wars against Japan. So, what do, what do you do? You you undertake a planned strategic retreat, letting your adversary come to you, let, letting your adversary overextend himself, uh, waste his energy, and ultimately basically weaken himself before you start fighting back. Other than just to do enough to keep him involved and to, to keep him interested in the fight. He draws the analogy to two boxers again. The clever boxer doesn't go rushing in and starting to flail and just flailing away and wasting all his energy. He gives ground. He lets the other guy flail, flail away and waste his energy. Ultimately, ultimately, you, could, you, would, you would see uh, if it works out as, as, uh, as, as he planned, you're going to see a crossover point whereby the stronger, the stronger contender is now the weaker contender and the clever but weaker contender is just going to be the stronger at the end. And he's going to win over time. Time. Is what, time is what it's all about in the Chinese in the Chinese strategic vision. So yeah, let the, if, the, if the other guy is foolish enough to, to, to wail away and waste all of his, his energy, 
let him do it. Let him let him help defeat himself. In the end, ultimately, ultimately, the stronger boxer could end up uh, end up losing the bat simply because he was not patient uh, enough to enough to conserve his resources. So, if you if you transpose that to the map of the Pacific again, China, I, I would I would not uh, I would not expect the PLA to come out to, to come out far far into the Western Pacific and and and, and, and attempt a hard defense. I would expect them to, to see them pull back. Let the United States uh, Navy and the Joint Force overextend itself as it makes its, its way across the Pacific, and then if it, if it works out well for the PLA, they will we will be weakened enough that they can come out and fight and, and have a decisive clash somewhere in the Western Pacific with whatever remains of our force that uh, that, that uh, set out on the journey from Hawaii and uh, points on the Western Pacific, or the Western our West Coast rather. The uh, I have no idea whether Mao. Actually, actually followed boxing all that closely, but about the same time he was he was uh, he was thinking about these things. You saw the famous bout, the Rumble in the Jungle, in 1974 between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. It was very much the same approach that uh, that Ali brought to that fight. Everybody assumed that uh, that Foreman was just going to clobber him just because he was bigger, stronger, tough. All these all these sorts of things. Ali, he does he does the Maoist thing. He, he, uh, he lets he lets Foreman uh, have his way in the early rounds, conserves his own energy, and guess what? By the later rounds, uh, uh, Ali is actually able to take the lead and actually win that fight. So it is, I think I think another way to look at this, if you think about the rumble with the uh, in the jungle, I think we might we, we might see the similar approach shaping up for a rumble in the Pacific here as we look at uh, at, Mao, at a young Mao and a young Stalin, uh, thinking about how to thinking about how to make the, the world communist back in the 1950s. Uh, as China became a thing. So what does this mean in more practical terms? Well, I, I think that, I think a way to look at it is active defense means taking advantage if we are unwise not to, not to keep our formations and individual units within mutual support of each other. So if we are unwise, if we, if we, if we disperse, uh, if we disperse formations, if we disperse uh, uh, individual units uh, excessively, that, that makes it easier for China to fall on those things one by one. Or if it, if it can actually if it can actually make make mayhem for us uh, through deliberate action, through cyber attacks, through uh, any any number any number of things that would loosen up our organization, our command and control, our scouting ability ability to find a, a target adver adversaries. These are all things that you would see come, come under the rubric of of, uh, of active defense. So again, the weaker power, if the if the weaker power does things wisely, it can actually do the Maoist thing, do the rumble in the jungle thing, and ultimately prevail over the strong, which is how China believes that uh, that this will have this will play out. To look at it a little more uh, graphically here, and if, let's say that China wanted to defend some perimeter somewhere offshore, and I'll posit that that's about 1,500 nautical miles offshore as we, as we go along here. If you look at the blue team, so uh, units from the Joint Force making their way across the Pacific, at some point, we're going to cross this perimeter. And at that point, active defense, the active defenders from the PLA will try to fall on those individual units over and overwhelm them, mount a tactical superiority over these individual units and take us down one by one. That's a, and I think that's, I think it's a, actually a pretty impressive way of doing things. It's how it's, 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 it's a relative of how Imperial Japan thought about doing things in the 1940s. I think that if you're the weaker power, you have to do things smarter. And I think that's, I think that's one thing that impresses me about, uh, about the communist China is these are people who are actually rather humble. I mean, they're actually, they actually have a real sense of their own limits and their need to overcome these limits. So that's a, that's one thing I think you'll find when you deal with the, when you deal with China in the coming years, those of you who are on active duty. Mao also, he also gives the, the metaphor of a hand. What does he mean by this? He's trying to explain to, to your average Chinese peasant exactly how this works, how this, how this effort of uh, active defense uh, individual tactical victories that lead to big strategic results over time. How does it work? Well, he's, here's what he says. It's, it's, if, we are trying to, if we are trying to produce a battle of annihilation, he's, he's making a claim that if I, if I can actually cut off one of my enemy's hands, or excuse me, one of my enemy's fingers off of his hand, that's better than mashing all of them and doing damage to all of them. So if I can annihilate an entire, an entire unit out of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, out of the Pacific Air Forces or whoever, I've done a, I've done a heck of a lot in terms of uh, morale, material, all these dimensions of strategy. And he's contending that he's contending that, that is the way to do things. So try to fragment your enemy and, again, try to go after the, the units that you have been fragmented and take them down one by one. So what does that mean? If you do, if you think about it, come back to his metaphor of the hand. 
if I can cut off those fingers one by one, he's, he's not going to be able to make much of a fist over time. Again, if I do things wisely, if I'm able to take advantage of my adversary's uh, self-defeating behavior, whatever the case may be. So this is, I mean, this is, and this is something that I think is deeply rooted in China's way of war. And it's something we really have to be uh, prepared with. This is a, this is actually, this was another thing I did a couple of years ago. We, it was, this, this very seldom happens in Newport, but we got sort of a peremptory note from the Pentagon. It says, there's this thing out in China called system of systems warfare. What the heck does that mean? And you guys need to start teaching it. So I, 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 tried to, I went and I tried to make myself smart on it and I put together a small article on it. And it's basically, it's nothing more than sort of a high tech uh, way of saying what I've been saying. It's about disrupting networks. It's about if, we, if your adversary fights in a system of systems, whether, it, whether it's a system of systems of, 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 the, of a carrier air wing working with two carriers like we just did in the, in the Western Pacific, uh, whatever the case may be, if you can break that system down, at that point, that simplifies the process. The process makes, makes victory thinkable even for the weaker force that's operating on its home territory as the PLA will be uh, any, in, in most conceivable contingencies anytime, anytime soon that we might get into with them. How does that work? Well, I, 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 I posited, you will, not, you will not see this, by the way. You're not going to see a fixed number like I've I posited in this graphic anywhere in Chinese strategic commentary, but it does feel like it does feel like it comes up an awful lot, sort of uh, almost by accident. And I think it actually describes uh, what, what China's trying to accomplish rather well. If you think about the, where the outer, outer limits of that crumple zone are, that active defense are, it seems like it, it, seems like it sort of coincides with the second island chain, uh, Asia's second island chain, which of course runs uh, from northern Japan down through Guam and uh, terminates uh, in New Guinea usually, depending on how you want to, to interpret, the, interpret that uh, geographic feature. So. I'll, I will at least posit, will posit to you that, that's, that that sort of marks the outer limits of China's uh, active defense strategy for the Western Pacific. And I'll just trace that on, on down. You'll see, that, you'll see that a lot of what China wants to accomplish in the world falls within that zone. Again, it's Senkaku Island, settling things with Taiwan, settling things in the South China Sea. All of these things are pretty well, if you think about mounting a forward defense of these zones that China would like to slow us down to getting, from getting to, that actually, this actually makes a good deal of sense. So, I mean, again, I, mean, I wouldn't say this is a hard or fixed limit in Chinese minds, but I think, I, but I think it at least gives you something to to think about when we try to foresee what we're up against if we get in a, get in a scrap with China. So, let me shift gears a little bit as I try to put more substance into these these ideas from Mao from the PLE leadership today. And I'm going to shift gears, and I'm, I'm going to start uh, talking from a strategic theoretical standpoint. And I think you'll, you'll see what, I think, I hope you'll see what I'm trying to get at. The idea, and I've described it, in fact, I called it faces of Chinese sea power in the, in the, in the article, but uh, I think, I think you'll, I think you'll get, you'll get what I'm trying to accomplish as I go along. So let me just dive right in, into it. Here's the, here's the basic idea. This is the, uh, this is the strategic theorist, uh, Bernard Brody, probably, probably America's best strategic thinker of the 20th century. And uh, in one of his books, he makes, he makes a really simple point. It's uh, sometimes it's possible to have a really great idea about strategy, but you don't have the technology to make that idea come true. Sometimes, sometimes the idea will lie fallow for a long time, and sometimes, and, and, uh, sometimes uh, somebody will invent some new technology or war making method or whatever that, that, that brings that to life and makes it a going concern. And I, I will posit to you for the next few minutes that I think that's what China is doing. It's taking good ideas out of the past, pairing and pairing those ideas up with new technology, uh, and using and using them to prosecute an active defense well offshore, way way out into the Western Pacific. The first idea is this, and this is an American idea. This is uh, this this idea of a fortress fleet comes from anybody who's a War College graduate. Some of you at Dallas are. It comes from Mahan, our second president of the Naval War College and, uh, and the author of what has been called the, the, most, uh, the most significant nonfiction American book of the 19th century, The Influence of Sea Power Upon, upon History, 1660 to 1783. Mahan lived, uh, he lived in, in an era of flux, something like our own. He, he, uh, served in the, he served in the Civil War on blockade duty, so he saw the changeover from, steam, from uh, sail to steam. Uh, he saw the advent of big guns. He saw the advent of, of all these things that we tend to associate with the modern mechanized Navy. And he lived long enough to, to comment on the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905. This is where he, got the, he gets this idea of, of the fortress fleet. 
to make a long story very short, the, the idea that he was uh, actually criticizing, he was deeply, he, de he deeply condemned the Russian Navy, which was defending the, de or excuse me, defending the fort at uh, Port Arthur in North China. And it, he, he criticized Russian practices because they kept the fleet under the guns of the fort. Supposedly, supposedly the fleet that was there to mount a forward defense of the port, in reality, it was taking shelter under the guns of the fort in order to hold off the, the superior Japanese fleet that was operating offshore under, under Admiral Togo. So this, to them, so to Mahan, this was a deeply flawed way of thinking about it. I mean, think about what the range of a gun is in 1904. Right? Five miles, 10 miles, not even, probably not even, probably, probably not even that. Point being, it's a, it's a very small sea area that the fleet has to operate if the range of the guns is this limited. So you have, you have, have very heavy firepower, but very limited range. And that really, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's not only does it limit the mobility of the fleet, it also uh, instills all sort of bad habits, timidity and so forth among Russian commanders. And he, he just basically says, this is a really bad deal. Don't do this. So that's a, that's a, that's a brief synopsis of his, uh, his critique of uh, the Russian handling of the Russo-Japanese war. But as we well know, you all, you're all seafarers, you all served at, you've all served at sea. The 20th century sees this critique start to break down. Firepower, firepower starts having much uh, greater le uh, range and lethality. If you, want to, if you want to think about this kamikaze approaching one of our carriers in uh, 1945, I mean, that's really a cruise missile with a human guidance system, isn't it? That's a, this, is a, this is a weapon system with long range and a, at least a measure of precision. Much, much, much more, lo much longer range, and uh, certainly much more precise than the guns of Port Arthur. So, I think that I think if we were to ask Mahan in 19 the 1940s whether his critique still applies, he might actually have a different view. And if here's just a picture of the USS Franklin, uh, who, which takes which takes a major hit off the Japanese coast in in 1945 from a single from a single airplane with uh, with two bombs. So, quite quite clearly, this is something a capital ship has to worry about as the 20th century goes on. Now this is a, and this is a logic that uh, that that our PLA friends have taken advantage of. It's we can talk about this during the Q and A, but I, I I don't think I have to tell anybody here that after the Cold War we sort of let our guard down as far as uh, as far as uh, developing new anti ship uh, missiles, all, all these things you need to wage war at sea. And our Chinese friends, when they started building up to to make themselves into a great sea power in the mid nineties, they see this and they put great effort into developing. Uh, families of long-range cruise missiles, uh, apparently long-range anti-ship ballistic missiles, the first well, the world's first uh, working missiles of their type, and they've had, they figured out how to outrange us because we here we are still still sitting and still relying on the harpoon as our uh, as our primary anti-ship uh, anti-ship weapon here 30 years after the Cold War. So even if so even if uh, even if Chinese missiles are not as good as ours, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that is still the case. If they still get the, if they if, if they have double our range and they can take pot shots at us for a long way, for a long distance before we get in in, in range to turn on uh, a return fire. That's uh, that's obviously something that uh, boosts their chances of success. Now I would put it, now I, I would put a, an asterisk on this. This is this is this this graphic is actually less and less true as we just start doing things like. Uh, Reinventing the anti-ship tomahawk, a capability that should never have been allowed to, to go away as we start uh, uh, arming our F-18s with uh, L. Rasm's long-range anti-ship missiles. That's going to give us a lot more reach. So I think that one of the things, I mean, one of the reasons that I actually feel much better about the competition than I did even a few years ago is the, that we do seem to be turning the corner on some of these things, getting our game face on, putting effort into, into correcting this problem. But I think that, I think for the moment this is uh, this is still a problem that we have to have to grapple with. Just a little eye candy. This is uh, this is a graphic out of a 2015 uh, military parade in downtown Beijing, showing us that they're always very good at painting the uh, painting the designations on their missiles that they want us to see. This is the DF-26, which is an anti-ship ballistic missile. Uh, the Pentagon guesses it has about a 200,000 or not a 200,000, but a 2,000 nautical mile reach out to sea against moving ships. So that's something that that's something that we still have to contend with, even once these other uh, these these other implements come into our own fleet. Now there's a, there's a lot of discussion about uh, about whether the Chinese can actually uh, find us and target us at such reaches or at such ranges. Most of you would have probably a better idea than that because you do classified work and I do not. So I, I would so I would put that I would put that asterisk on that particular observation. But the Pentagon does seem to pay pay attention to it in its annual reports on Chinese military power, and therefore. I think it uh, behooves us to take the, take the problem seriously as well. Here's what the here's what the uh, uh, the commentator the the narrator at that uh, at that uh, parade had to say. 
he's describing the DF-21D, which is a shorter range anti-ballistic missile, the first one that hit their, uh, hit their force a few years ago, about a 900 nautical mile reach on that one, according to the Pentagon. This is what, they, this is what Chinese see as an implement of act, not only active defense, they actually have a, they actually have a slightly different way or metaphor of, for describing what these things are, are. And this is the idea of the assassin's mace. If you think what an assassin can do, he can sneak up. He can sneak up on a stronger enemy if he can get behind him and bop him on the head with with some sort of a heavy weapon. You can actually take down a stronger foe, even with that. Even with that, uh, doing all that other stuff, uh, you know, falling back and so forth. We might actually be able to to go out and strike the U.S. Navy a heavy a heavy blow with anti ship uh, ballistic missiles long before the United States uh, Navy can get to get, get in range to strike back. So this is a, a bit of a variation on a theme that uh, that uh, that you run into with Mao. Here, this is the idea that you, mean, you might suddenly get it done. You might actually just strike a, a decisive blow, given these innovative new uh, technologies. This is a graphic out of CSIS in Washington, which I think are probably the best in the business of cataloging these capabilities. And, it's, uh, and it, it, illustrates, it illustrates the geographic scope of the challenge. That, uh, that, ring, number set, that ring number six is the uh, DF-26 range. Uh, fired from Chinese shores without even put it, putting an airplane or a ship out to sea. If they can reach out that far, then they can really uh, they can really make things tough on us uh, without even without even again launching a ship or a su or a submarine or an airplane. So this is this is something that we definitely have to uh, uh, to keep a close eye on and figure out how to counteract. It's not data, but it's not just those. Of course, of course, China has developed a family of aircraft. Uh, small, small surface ships, all bearing, all bearing anti-ship uh, cruise missiles. Again, to go out and, pen, and mount that presence offshore, strike as a, strike at us as we make our way across the Pacific, weaken us until, uh, hopefully, from the PLA standpoint, the PLA can come out and fight an even, or perhaps better an e than even, odds uh, engagement against the United States. This is uh, many of you are familiar with uh, the, the great Wayne Hughes, who just uh, went to his reward within the last few months. This is an image of the last. Uh, of the the last version of his uh, his his classic work, Fleet Tactics, in which he points he, he pays great homage to shore-based sea power, which is what which is what anti-ship ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, all of these shore-based uh, implements are. These are the latter-day uh, equivalents to the to the guns of Port Arthur, and they have very long range, and they also have very long uh, great precision. Uh, with the caveat that I put on there as well. So I think this I think this takes a lot of oomph out of uh, Mahan's critique. Of Russian, the Russian handling of the of, of the guns of Port Arthur a century ago, if you get because if you think about, I mean, if you look at the if you look at those range arcs, that provides a whole lot of area for your fleet to operate. No longer are you constrained so much, not not even nearly so much on the map. No longer do you think in timid terms. You really, you really you've really made a, mer a merger of uh, offensive and defensive technologies and methods viable in a way that the Russian Navy could simply could not do back in those days. So. Just to remind, just to just to get to encapsulate some of the shore-based systems, we certainly live in an in, in an age of shore-based sea power, and I think that's something that uh, that really that really underlines the China challenge in the Western Pacific. So, where does the uh, where does the fortress fleet? If this is a latter-day fortress fleet uh, that we see shaping up, I would say I would say look at look at all these systems that can reach out to uh, uh, varying distances. Some, some, some even well beyond the second island chain, even outside this envelope that I have posited that is the primary area of interest for, uh, for Chinese defenders. So man, a century ago, he said this is a ra radically erroneous way of doing things. I don't think that critique holds, holds, holds up anymore. And if we, could, if we could summon him up today, I think he would, he would have to agree with that as well. Second, second old, old idea that I think China is making new is the idea of, it, of the je ne call. And this is a, this is an idea that actually comes out of the French Navy, also in the 19th century, and it's a it's a brainchild of this gentleman right here, Admiral Olb. I won't even I don't have any French, so I will not uh, I won't try to uh, uh, pronounce his name too much. But this is the idea that if if I'm France, I don't care about being a blue water navy. I don't care about competing with and defeating the Royal Navy, Britain's Royal Navy, in action. All I want to do is keep them out of my backyard, keep them away from French coast, so that I can uh, that I can turn my attention to interests on land, things that interest me more. And how do you do that? Well, that's, I mean, that's in the, the era when Mahan's a young man. This is the era in which uh, torpedo boats are starting to come online. Uh, sea mines are starting to, starting to be a thing. Uh, torpedoes, uh, torpedoes themselves are starting to make an entry into fleets worldwide. And Ob, Ob points out, yeah, you know what? I'm not going to defeat the Royal Navy with these, but I can certainly mount a buffer and keep the Royal Navy 
out of uh, off French off of French coast and make things tough on them. It can it can do what I was describing with China trying to mount that uh, that active defense. Here's a, these are Norwegian Norwegian torpedo boats of those days. Oh, sorry about that. But the uh, I mean it gives you it gives you the sense these are these are less small light craft that you can afford to build and build in bulk. And you can also, if you can, you can arm them with implements strong enough to strike at capital ships. That's a really, that's a really good deal. Uh, if you're, if you're a power like France that doesn't want to put all of its national treasure into sea power and it wants to do defense on the cheap, this is a way to do it. And it's, a, it's something that really gives uh, naval commanders from the Royal Navy and other great navies fits moving into the 20th century. Here's, a, here's, a, here's how uh, one of our authors that we uh, stu that we study with our students uh, sums it up. It's, it's a David meets Goliath situation. The, tor the torpedo boat can threaten a battleship. It cannot, it cannot defeat a fleet on the high seas, but you know what? It can make things really hard on that fleet if, if, if that fleet ventures into your coastal waters. You can strike it, you can, you can, you can really limit that uh, fleet's military movement uh, on the cheap with using these small craft that, uh, that uh, Ope thought were, thought were the way to center French maritime strategy on. So yeah, again, you can't win, but you know what you might accomplish what you want to, which is what strategy is all about. This is a, as I mentioned Imperial Japan a, a few minutes ago. I, I mean, this is very much the same idea that the, that, uh, the Japan planned on against the US Pacific fleet starting at, starting in the, during the presidency of Teddy Roosevelt. This is, these were ideas they worked on forever. Put the seas islands out in the Pacific, put airplanes on those islands, put submarines in the waters around those islands and strike repeated small blows at the Pacific fleet cutting it, cutting it down to size on its westward voyage. So until, until such time as the Imperial Japanese Navy's battle fleet can come out and wage, and wage a battle uh, on even terms or perhaps even better. So in a sense, you can, do, in a sense you can see China as a uh, strategy as a descendant of that, except it's actually easier for China because they don't, they don't have to go out and seize the Mariana Islands or any of that kind of stuff. They can accomplish uh, much the same thing uh, with all that family of weaponry that I, uh, that I depicted for you graphically a few minutes ago. Things like this. The, uh, the, I think I would describe this as a descendant of the uh, uh, the torpedo boats we were just looking at, the Type 22 uh, Hobe, Hobe catamaran, of which China is uh, apparently building about 85. Each each packing uh, eight anti-ship cruise missiles, suitable for loitering uh, loitering offshore and making things hard on us uh, before we can approach China's coast. Diesel submarines. I would still I would still describe the uh, the diesel submarine fleet as the core of China's. Uh, China's Navy that it's constructed over the last 25 years. I think it's, I think, I think this, this is less and less so as the surface Navy starts to, starts to really fill out. But I think that when you think about an active defense, this is, a, this is really the way to do it. Again, all missile armed, all suitable for lurking offshore and striking at us as we, as we make our way across the Pacific. Tactical aircraft, also, also, also mounting uh, anti-ship cruise missiles. If this indeed is a, is a descendant of the Je ne Cole, this, uh, this French idea from the 19th century, You'll see that you'll see that there's a lot of it, it actually maps quite well to this to this offshore defense perimeter that I've posited. These are all things that are suitable for striking uh, hundreds or perhaps even thousands of uh, nautical miles offshore. So, if I can if I can operate if I can deliver shore firepower to support the fleet well offshore, and if I can also send all these other these all, all these other light craft out to also def uh, protect and lend their firepower to a fleet engagement. That, 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 uh, that adds up to a pretty dense uh, maze of defenses that, uh, that we have to navigate in order to wage war effectively in the, in the Western Pacific. So my, my, silly way, my silly way of summing this up is, I mean, it's, it's, I, I think this all adds up to an offshore forward defense, a crumple zone designed to absorb the shock of our cross Pacific offensive and hopefully, and hopefully give, try, give the PLA time to do what it needs or perhaps even defeat us all together. And that's it. So again, I think this is the challenge of our times. And something that we all need to uh, that, we, that we all need to uh, bring into bring into our everyday discourses about strategy. Because I think this is basically the idea. They, they hope that we will run into those defenses and be slowed down and lose our energy and perhaps even lose the war. Okay, then I will I will stop it. I will I will go into fast forward here because, uh, because that, that was really the heart of because I think I think active defense is still really the basis for Chinese maritime strategy. What do you do if what do you do if you're uh, if you're active defense if this family of shore based and sea based weaponry is so good that you can do it with without even without even needing to send the battle fleet into action at that point it becomes what we call a footloose fleet the fleet can go wherever the leadership in Beijing wants to see it to send it if 
the uh, fortress fleet and if the, the, the je ne quoi components of the chi China's Navy can actually get it done without the surface fleet. I don't think China is, is nearly here this, uh, at this point, but I think this is the ideal towards which they are striving. And then here's another face of Chinese sea power. Here's a, a, President T.R. back in 1907. He actually, this is like, to me, this is actually a wonderful way of summing up the relationship between shore-based firepower, short-range uh, platforms, je ne quoi type platforms, and the battle fleet. Here's what he says in his annual message to Congress that year, which was the, the forerunner to the uh, State of the Union address. He, it's just really, it's a, it's a really pretty rich uh, statement about uh, maritime strategy. The only use for the Navy, by which he means the battle fleet, is for offense. This should be a blue water offensive force. So I want to be able to send this uh, to project power into, into the rimlands of uh, East Asia or Western Europe, or what, whatever the case may be. How do I do that? Well, I do that by getting my coast to defend themselves. We need to have, we need to have forts. We need to have uh, sea mines, torpedoes, submarines, to all the all of these all of these things that we've been talking about for the last few minutes. This is how we, our our cities, our harbors are actually going to defend themselves. We do that successfully. At that point, if the forts, if all that stuff is, is, is successful, the Navy, the battle fleet can be foot loose. It can roam wherever the leadership in Washington wants it to go. I think, I think this is very much the logic that he brings in when he sends the Great White Fleet around the world. He actually, he actually talks about accepting risk. Yes, there's some risk to sending the fleet off, but at the same time, he also voices confidence in our, in our shore-based defenses to, to gain time in case we get in the scrap with Imperial Germany or whoever the enemy might be. So that, is, that to me is a pretty rich statement about, uh, about the relationship between the defensive and the offensive components of any Navy. So it's, and I, that, that's, certainly what, that's certainly the face that I put, would put it on it. The, uh, the ultimate goal, is, it's a very Mahanian goal. It's command of the sea. Absolute control permanently would be, would be the, uh, the ideal towards which any Navy that strives to, strives to uh, succeed at sea is going to strive towards. Look at, look at what Mahan, Mahan is not known as a great writer, but, uh, but this is actually a great turn of a phrase, which is one reason it's still with us after all these. It's overbearing power on the sea. We drive off an enemy's flag or at most allow it to appear as a fugitive. That again, that means I control the waters I care about permanently and, most, and almost absolutely. This is an idea that is, a, that is a fixture in Chinese strategic commentaries. In fact, this was the first of Mahanian idea that, that just started appearing in uh, Chinese strategic commentaries back in the 1990s and increasingly into the 2000s and up to the present day. The idea that one Navy is going to meet another in action and completely sweep it from the, from the, uh, from the sea. The, 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 uh, I, guess, I guess sort of the gold standards being the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805 when Royal, the Royal Navy under Nelson sweeps the French and the Spanish from the sea. And then, of course, being the Russo-Japanese War in 1905 when... Uh, uh, when Togo actually uh, sweeps the Imperial Russian Navy from the sea, winning absolute command of the sea in Mahanian terms. It's an ideal, it's, it's an ideal to, towards, which, uh, towards which the PLA has striven for a long time, long before it had the implements to put uh, substance into this. They're already, in 2004, in their defense white paper that year, talking about winning command of the sea and command of the air that you need in order to control the maritime commons. So again, aspiration, aspiration led, uh, led tactical innovation and led technology quite a bit for the PLA. These are people with big ideas about what they can and should accomplish in the Western Pacific. What do we do about it? Well, we try to deter, which we try to deter the Chinese from actually doing all this stuff, from coming out and picking a fight with us, trying to, to, trying to get its aims at the expense of our allies. Henry Kissinger, one of the greats uh, of all time, he, he, he says that deterrence is a multiple of capability, resolve, and belief. You all are capability, both, both uh, material capability and also through your skills and through your, uh, uh, through, and through your and Elon, whatever you want to say, the, the human component. Resolve would be political resolve. Resolve of, but resolve of our political leadership in Washington to, to use that capability to uh, uh, prevent our adversaries from doing what they might want to do that we want to forbid. And belief, this would be this would be our our efforts as a, as a nation to convince China that we could indeed defeat their aims. So, if we have that mix of capability, resolve to use our capability, and if we can make the adversary believers in our capability and resolve, we have some chance of. I mean, nobody nobody gets into an unwinnable fight. That's sort of the logic of deterrence. How do you do that? Well, access denial is not just a Chinese thing. I mean, it's a, that's what we've been talking about uh, the, most of this hour. And, uh, but this is something that we can do. We can, we can turn the tables on the Chinese. And in fact, we're in a strong position to do just that if we do things wisely. Uh, this is an idea I've been pushing for almost 10 years now. Yeah, I, push, I started pushing a decade now 
uh, in the pages of proceedings and, uh, and elsewhere in, in my other publishing homes. And this is the, basically just the idea that we need to take our, our, our geographic position with our allies in the Western Pacific and basically bar China's, China's access to the Western Pacific. That brings the pain both economically, uh, it, hand, it handicaps China's uh, efforts to, to project diplomatic power and military power. And this is something, this is something that's, uh, that, would, that I think stands a good chance of deterring uh, China from doing things that we want to forbid, attacking Taiwan. Again, all the laundry list of things that we've been talking about. I would describe it as, uh, as, as making the first island chain from southern, from southern Japan down through Taiwan and through the Philippines and around, and around the Indonesian, Indonesian archipelago into a wall. Use our, act, use our ability to, to block those straits, to keep the Chinese Navy and the Chinese Air Force and the Chinese merchant fleet within the first island chain. And again, bring the herd on, on China. If we can threaten to do that successfully, I think we have a good chance of discouraging China from uh, doing things that, uh, that, that uh, we think they should not do that are contrary to our purposes and our, uh, and our ideals. This is just, to, just to show you graphically, this is a Chinese depiction of all the focal areas, all the straits that go through the first island chain the more we can, the more we can make that into an impassable wall to Chinese maritime movements. Again, I think the, the better off we are as far as trying to deter Beijing. What implements do you do that? To, do you do that with? Well, in a sense, we're I'm, I'm saying that we should reach back to the fortress fleet ideas and the Je Nicole ideas ourselves and do it with 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 families of small, inexpensive, and plentiful weapon systems, diesel submarines. I, I see. This is I, I, I never get anywhere with this, but to me it makes sense that we could actually uh, either unmanned or manned diesel submarines. These are these are things that we could uh, that these are things that we could use in the United States Navy in con in concert with our allies to plug up the straits like Miyako and all the different straits that I've just depicted. Small corvettes, latter latter day uh, latter day torpedo boats. This is the, this is a picture of the Swedish Visby, a uh, small stealthy uh, corvette that uh, that packs a pretty heavy punch. The Norwegians have the skilled and a, a counterpart that is also very impressive. These are things that we ought to be looking into. The Marines and the Army are getting to, into this. You can you, we could easily we could easily develop the capability in concert with our allies to put small bodies of, of troops on those islands adjoining those straits and reach out and make things tougher on Chinese shipping and aircraft trying to make their way out into the Western Pacific from the China, from, from the, uh, China Seas. The Air Force is getting very much into the, into the whole, into the whole uh, maritime game, which is also great to see, doing things like using B-52s to drop uh, quick strike mines. Uh, the B-1 was actually the first aircraft to, to, uh, to, to mount the long-range anti-ship missile a couple of years ago. So again, this is going to be very much an era of joint sea power that's shaping up. And you get the idea, unmanned vehicles of all types. I like that, I actually like that one in the background better, but this, the, the unmanned ships, are. The, I think that's, that's going to be a supplement to this effort to, to make the, the first island chain impassable. If we can do that, if we can do that with all those, uh, all those lighter craft, lighter systems, at that point, I think our own battle fleet becomes, uh, if you want to think of it in football terms, I think these become free safeties. They operate behind the first island chain and they go to points at which the VLA might break out and help play and help reinforce that uh, that segment of the wall. So again, this is this would be part of the uh, defense in depth that the Navy would mount in, in concert with our with our with our sister services, the Air Force, the Army, and the Marines. Naval integration is uh, kind of the buzz phrase of, of lately. Uh, trying to trying to work as one implement at sea with the Marine Corps, I think, only makes sense. And it's and this uh, this is Commandant Berger. I think he's really uh, he's really signed on to this idea and is doing a great job of uh, pushing it. We can, uh, and the last thing before I close and open up for, uh, for Q&A is one thing we need to do is make sure that our allies are confident in our ability to honor our security promises to them. The more we can put American, uh, American uh, forces, American people on the, on the ground, in, in, on the territory of our allies, the more that signals to, to, uh, to uh, leadership in Beijing that we will be there. If they are killing, if they are killing America's sons and daughters, you can darn well bet that, uh, that we will come and honor our security promises to our allies. Much as much as we did uh, during the Cold War, by stationing a brigade, brigade of army troops in, in Berlin, had no chance of stemming a Soviet or East German offensive. But you know what? That signaled to the communist world that we would defend Berlin and we would defend West Germany and also NATO as a whole. So that's this is what it's what this uh, author uh, Nicholas Nassim Taylor would call skin in the game. If we, to the extent that we show we have skin in the game of maritime strategy in the Western Pacific. We are showing that we are showing that uh, all those capabilities that we have, that would be brought into uh, into play, we have the resolve to use them. And that at that point, we hearten our allies: Japan, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, whoever the case may be. 
So that's uh, I've, I've thrown a lot of material at you. That's that's kind of where that's kind of where I leave off. Uh, China is China under President Xi is always talking about its dream, its dream, its dream of uh, national rejuvenation after a century of humiliation, extending uh, from the 19th into the 20th century. It's economic. This is an economic dream. It's a military dream. It's a diplomatic dream. If we can if we can convince our friends in Beijing that we can actually defeat that dream, we can we can make that dream not come true. That becomes a really a really powerful deterrent to Chinese misbehavior that we would like to that we would like to deter. And I think that's kind of uh, that's kind of where I think we are. Uh, I look forward to hearing you whatever whatever questions you have. If it's if you have some question on what anything I said or if I didn't if there's something I didn't cover quite quite clearly, I couldn't. You can't talk China in uh, 45 minutes and cover all bases. So uh, look forward to hearing what's on your mind. Thank you for your uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>